Hello, uh, my name is Alan Foom and it's December 2022. So today I'm going to talk about missing the hydrocarbon trap with your expiration well. Uh, it could be several explanations. It's basically, it's about looking at old wells, seeing whether there's hidden potential there. So not all exploration wells are drilled in the optimal locations. And they could be subsequently seen as suboptimal with new data, uh, new knowledge, new ideas. So always worthwhile having another look to see what's possibly there. There could be several reasons for mislocation, particularly for older wildcat wells, and we'll have a look at some of those. And we need to relook at old exploration wells, check if they truly tested the traps. Maybe they haven't. Maybe there's extra potential that's still there. So this post is inspired by a social media post by Professor Alexei Milkov of the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, he published a paper with um, uh, Dr. Samis in, the 19, in 2019 in APG Bulletin. And it basically had these five scenarios. So scenario A is you drill the well in the right place. A structure was just predicted. Uh, didn't work. Dry hole. No further potential. Uh, C is the well's drilled in the right place. The structure is different to prognosis, but still no further potential. E, well drilled in the right place. Structure doesn't really exist, so no further potential. But the two potentials that are here, case B, which is the well was drilled off structure. Uh, so, but the structure is roughly as predicted from the seismic when you tie the well in. Uh, so potentially this future potential update from the well. And D, where the well has been drilled off structure and the structure is way different to what you prognosed through perhaps velocity changes. And we'll look at that in a minute. And there's potential for future um, uh, exploration work. So what is a hydrocarbon trap? Now, oil and gas are lighter than water and they'll float to the surface uh, and form hydrocarbon seeps, unless they're trapped by ponding in a geological feature. Now, there are two basic types of traps. So structural traps. I'll talk mainly about these. Uh, which are formed by tectonic deformation, and the stratigraphic traps, which are formed by changes in sedimentary lock la la layering. These are a little bit harder uh, to understand because there's more complexity. These tend to be a bit simpler, so we'll just look at those. So structural traps, uh, you've got an anticline, which is caused by, which has downward dip on all sides, basically like a do rock dome. It can be formed by compressional folding or draping over the light conformity, or maybe by folding the, uh, over something like a salt diapir or mobile shale. Tilted fault blocks, you've got an extensional fault. Uh, this side slides down, this side stays up, and you've got a tilted fault block or a horst. So it's closed on one side by a fault and then on the other sides by a structural dip. Or it could be two faults and a structural dip, etc. Or it could be a thrust-related fault, so this is in compressional setting, so it's a bit like a rolled up carpet, you know, a rolled up rug. So here's a few concepts within a structural trap. So you've got a contour map here. So these are contours. That's the top, and uh, this is the spill point now. And this is a cross section running through here. Spill point is a saddle between the possible trap and anything else. So hydrocarbons will fill up to here and then eventually spill out. The crest is the highest point of the structure. The relief is the distance between the crest and the spill point. And the column height is the distance between the crest and the hydrocarbon water contact. Note the hydrocarbon water contact is not always at the spill point. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, sometimes it could be because the spill point hasn't actually been mapped in quite the right place. Sometimes because there's not been enough fill. Or there's been perhaps a little bit of leakage at the top through seal failure. And I've got a video on uh, hydrocarbon seals. Now, what could possibly go wrong? Now, one thing could be that the well isn't where you think it is. This is an example from the North Sea, where the originally uh, people thought so that they had drilled the well at the crest of the structure, but the seismic never kind of fitted the well very well. They thought, well, maybe it might be mismigrated. I'll talk about seismic migration in a minute, maybe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the well had a contact. They thought they had a little small accumulation at the top that wasn't economic. Then somebody had rechecked the well location. They found that the well was drilled about uh, two and a half kilometers to the west. The well was drilled quite a way down dip, and you had all this up dip hydrocarbons. So they drilled an appraisal well up here, confirmed it, and developed it as a field. Uh, quite a bit later than uh, this well had originally been been drilled. So old well locations may not be accurate and need checking. Now on land, that's fairly easy. You just go to the well location with a GPS uh, 
device and check it there. At sea, it's a little bit harder. You might need magnetometer surveying, etc. But it's something to have a look at. Another one is seismic imaging with positioning and resolution. How well imaged is your trap? It could be that you mislocated your well because you just couldn't image the thing properly in the first place. So quite a lot of old data we've been drilled on 2D seismic. Looking at these sections, quite difficult to make out where it is. 3D seismic, a bit better because you've got these pixels that represent the bins. And also to do with uh, horizontal resolution and interpretation. So how good is your seismic data? How well is it done? Another specific issue is seismic migration. Now, seismic migration is a key process within seismic processing to produce a reasonably accurate, reasonably resolved image where the reflectors are roughly in the right place. So take account of ray tracing uh, when the rays for the, uh, for the sound go through the media. And the different types of depth migration, um, and they tend to be more accurate with time. So new algorithms, new ways of doing it, moving to working in the depth domain rather than working in the time domain. I've got a video on depth domain imaging, uh, which explains all of this. But basically, early, start, early wells may have been drilled on this uh, post that time migration, which may not have been that accurate, whereas the new types of uh, migration are a lot more accurate, so you're more likely to place a well in a better place. Another issue is seismic static corrections. Now, this is a particular issue when uh, in places like Algeria, where you're going through sand dunes or places with rough topography. Now, the seismic data has to all be lined up onto the seismic data. Now, that could be sea level, that could be above sea level, depending on the territory that you're in. And you also have waves going through relatively low velocity layers, for example, sand dunes. And you have to make corrections for that. Now, it's a very difficult process and you don't always get it right. So sometimes you may get a distorted image of your structure and you may have therefore drilled the well in the wrong place. There are also velocity anomalies. Now, all seismic data is recorded in the time domain, but we need to work in depth. And the way of moving between that is using uh, depth conversions. So time, velocity, depth. But um, because you're working in time, and particularly if you are working in time domain data, you could get distortions. So for example, limestone has got very high velocity and that may produce a false structure. You also have a situation where you have a fault, you've got a relatively low velocity layer, and then you've got a distortion in the way the fault is imaged. Now, depth, depth migration takes care of that, but if you don't have depth migration, maybe not possible to do it in the, quite the right way, and maybe the well may have been pressed wrongly. So this is a summary of structural uncertainties that you deal with. So you've got alternative seismic picks, where you may not have interpreted the top of the reservoir correctly. Uh, with hindsight, you may put it somewhere else. There could be shallow, deeper velocity models. And if you drill off structure, you could miss the field. So that's to do with the structure. So that's where this, these things commonly happen. However, there are two other peculiarities that I'll talk about where these, uh, where you may have missed the field or got a distorted view of the field. Now, this is an example with a tilted contact. Now, most hydrocarbon water contacts are flat, but not all of them are. And this is a North Sea example of a field I, I had worked with. And there are other fields in the play that have similar situations where we had well B, we had well A, we thought it was separated, we were all separated by fault, we thought it was a ceiling fault, but the pressures didn't kind of add up. And the seismic anomalies didn't kind of add up. And then when we drilled wells D, E, uh, contacts keep getting deeper. We drilled C, the contact was a lot shallower than expected. Someone lined up the contacts, it was a flat plane caused by hydrodynamics within a very large aquifer. Uh, so again, look at the seismic anomalies, see if they add up with the contacts. A further missing the field is a situation which is to do with stratigraphy rather than the trap. And the two examples in North Sea, uh, the Nelson Field and Everest Field, both in the 40s play, where the initial well was drilled in a clay filled channel with very poor reservoir, a few strings of sand, but mostly clay with hydrocarbons in it, and people kind of walked away. They thought, yeah, the reservoir is going to be lousy. But then uh, on Everest, somebody drilled off structure looking for a deeper play, but you obviously had to go through the shallow 40s reservoir to get there. And they found hydrocarbons in the shallow 40s reservoir and thought, what's going on here? And then with slightly better seismic data, you can then image the channels and the lobes, and you realized that was going on. Now, the geologist who had then worked on Everest, so Mark Goodchild, he then went to work for a company called Enterprise, who picked up the Nelson license, also in the North Sea, and he used this experience to discover the Nelson field, which is the field that made Enterprise Oil a very successful company. 
So again, drilling the wrong facies. So to sum up, we do miss hydrocarbon straps. Now, people work with the data the best they can. You know, these are competent people, mostly. They tend to have the hearts in the right place, the minds in the right place. But people do drill wells in the wrong place. When you reanalyze the data, you may find that the well has been mislocated. You know, there's service problems. Is the well where it should be? You may have poor seismic imaging at the time the well was drilled. You've got new data. You can see, oh, the well's been drilled off structure. Maybe we ought to go, drill, go up dip. Seismic velocity issues, particularly in the areas of the complex seismic overburden, where maybe you might be in a situation where you cannot uh, image the, the, thing, the structure properly. Whereas if you can with better seismic velocities, maybe depth of domain data, depth of migrated data, you can see what's happening. Another one to bear in mind is tilted contacts, particularly if they've been found in the play that you're looking at. Do the seismic anomalies line up? Do the wells line up? You could, your field could be significantly larger than you had originally thought. And did the well get drilled in the wrong facies, the initial exploration well? Again, with better with the data they had at the time, they couldn't tell. With new data, maybe you can. So it's a good idea to re-examine old exploration wells. There might be hidden gems out there. You never know. And just check if the evidence stacks up, if everything comes through. So thank you very much. I hope you have a really good Christmas and a happy new year. And please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.